All right. So speaking about web security in 2019, James Bromberger. Give him a big hand. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Bromberger. Kia ora. Good morning. Hello and welcome. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm humbled and honored that you have come to, to hear me talk about some stuff. Um, let me start with telling you firstly who I am and why uh, I've got something to say here. Um, so I've been doing web stuff for a, a little while now, um, 95. And I was checking recently, and the content still renders, um, which is a testament to, to how well browsers have maintained their compatibility over time. Um, I got my first paid gig uh, doing web development then. I went on to become webmaster of my university for a good couple of years. Um, and I was sitting yesterday in Aaron's talk uh, on the uh, was a vivisection of a browser. Um, it was a, a great talk. I do recommend it. You go back and watch the stream if you didn't catch it. Um, I remember the OzWeb conference in Balor in 1999, where about 40 people got together. It was probably all of the people who had been doing web stuff um, around that time in universities, talking about the standards and how they were developing and what we were going to be doing with the web. Um, I've been one of the Debian Linux developers for, oh god, it's 18 years now. Um, I've done a bit of time working in the finance industry. Uh, so the second picture up there was when um, I ran LCA in 03 with some guy who came over to visit us. Um, and I was just thinking last night, I've got a sort of 10 years later photo um, of a similar thing at the moment. Um, I worked for a printing company in the UK and an advertising company in the UK. Uh, I returned to Australia in 2010 um, with my little souvenir called Oscar. Um, and uh, we've been back now for, for nine years. Um, I've done a stint working for a certain cloud company who opened here in Australia a couple of years as their security solution architect um, across Australia and New Zealand. So uh, I've actually spent a fair bit of time in Auckland over a few years delivering keynotes on security uh, in the cloud. Um, and right now I work as a consulting director uh, for a consulting company across Australia, in fact around the world now they are, um, called Modus, who probably many of you have never heard of. Um, but we do a lot of projects in um, government, state and federal government, um, and that's where I've spent the last couple of years. And across all of that time, I've still been doing a bit of web stuff in the background. And uh, there's been some interesting things that have been happening more recently, which when you look around and survey, a little bit of surveillance on what's out there, you find, oh my god, there's a lot of stuff that people have left turned on or they haven't taken advantage of, which they easily could today. So a little tour of that. But in the beginning, ye old browser of old, touched on recently yesterday. Uh, the, one of the first browsers, though not the very first, uh, was made by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, which was uh, the World Wide Web browser, as it was called, or World Wide Web. Um, it was a browser and an editor in one. Um, and obviously, as Aaron said yesterday, no images in it. We moved on to Mosaic uh, slightly after that, which did include images. Um, and then some of you in this room might then remember this. Anyone remember it? All right. There was a certain line in there which actually was quite interesting from a security point of view. Uh, it was that. Wow. This was when SSL landed. Um, and the hope of, oh my god, we could actually do something secure over an untrusted, insecure network. Um, however, there was, a, there was a barb in here. Anyone spot what the barb is? Yeah? International security. Which means good, yeah? Yeah, no. Um, sadly meant intentionally crippled. And, and although Aaron yesterday spoke about the browser wars, uh, we also had the crypto wars of uh, export grade cryptography where you might have a 128 bit key, but a large number of those bits were printed plain text every time it was handed out so that it could be um, intercepted. So, other things that have been happening a little bit more recently, we've been starting to see a massive uptake in using HTTPS for pretty much most of the web. So telemetry that's come from Firefox uh, has shown that this is hitting a high sort of 70, 80% now around the world. And it's looking like that trend is going to continue all the way up to the point that HTTP unencrypted will be removed. Um, these days, it's, it's pretty much not something you recommend for internal, external, no matter where it is, it's time to actually move that off to encrypted, trusted end-to-end -end encryption. So at the same time as we've seen an uptick in, in the amount of TLS or encrypted HTTPS traffic, we've also seen the continuing browser wars continue onwards. And this from StatCounter is showing obviously uh, Fire Chrome now hitting a sort of the 65, 70% of the market. It's really getting quite massive. Um, and in fact, if you look at the browsers which are quite modern, you'll see something like 81.9% of them as of sort of this time last night uh, or yesterday was um, that's what's being used in the wild. We've got quite modern browsers out there. Now, touching on Chrome a little deeper, 
One of the best things about Chrome is the fact that you can pretty much rely on it being up to date. The crossover period from an old version of Chrome to a new version is about two to three months. All of those semi-green lines that arc up over a month or two and then drop down again is Chrome in the wild switching from an older version to a new version. So that's pretty nice. We know that we've got quite modern browsers out there in use. But we've also had an event where we've had to get rid of older browsers which don't support current levels of cryptography. And one of the biggest events last year was from the 1st of July, where we had to have stronger encryption for anything doing payment. Now, has anybody here any, ever paid a credit card bill online? Everyone, right. So anytime you've had a credit card number passed across, obviously it has to be subject to very strict data handling and security, often mandated by the PCI or payment card industry data security standard. So they introduced a new uh, standard of this. In fact, they introduced it back in about 2015 or 16. And uh, most of the banks went, ooh, that looks good, but uh, way too soon. It's going to be a little few years until we can get there. And so it was uh, postponed a little bit until uh, the middle of, of last year. And it effectively told all of the cardholder environments that they had to remove early TLS, which was very early and still enabled on a lot of environments. So what this means between the auto-updating browsers out there in the wild and the, the distribution of browsers by, by vendors um, and the PCI environment means that we're now seeing that the legacy browser has really gone in the real world. It's not theoretical now. It only sort of remains in environments which have been historically locked down in a managed operating environment or, or standard operating environment. Anyone operating under one of those? Yeah, and it's always behind. Um, and so the argument or, or discussion I've had with a lot of security teams in, in public sector recently has been, do you know that the outside world is more up to date on browser technology than you are? And have you seen the list of security changes which are in the newer version? And why is your policy to install the current minus one browser as opposed to the current one when you are managing that environment? Look at the additional known vulnerabilities that you could already be protected from. So there's been a bit of a mind shift in some agencies and, and I've had some successes with some to actually move them to a, a much more rapid uptake up to date with the rest of the outside world because it's a better security policy for them. Um, so it led me on to, given strong requirements around security, especially with some of the workloads I've dealt with, um, some of them have exceeded the requirements around bank grade security. Anyone heard of bank grade security? Yeah, it's an awesome website. Go have a look at it and then choose your bank wisely. Um, it rates all of the banks by security around the world. Um, what can we do to improve security posture with as little code as possible. Now, I say as little code as possible because historically um, I've been, I guess I would have painted myself more with a sysadmin brush than a developer brush, but everyone does a bit of both because it's a brave new world and everybody wants full stack. Um, so what can we do now with as little actual code changes as possible? Well, it turns out there is a fair amount. And I'm gonna take you through a list of these things and what they actually mean and what your risks would look like and how easy these things are to do. Um, Step zero, as I said, is don't use HTTP uh, anymore. Go to HTTPS. Um, there are free certificates available, which used to be one of the old barriers, and I would highly recommend that if you've got a non-production environment, you should get appropriate certificates in that environment. All the way from development through test, through UAT to production, if you can get certificates being issued and handled correctly in development, you've got a far better chance of getting it right in production. Um, and if you can automate that, even better. Um, obviously, using HTTPS, it's not just about how much you value your content. You might think that your content is public, um, of no security value. It's not holding credit card information. But it's not about the data that you're serving from your, your side. It's about your visitors who are being intercepted. So who's used Wi-Fi in an airport? Uh, um, so if I turn on an access point right now called maybe um, Qantas free Wi-Fi, would you connect to it? Probably. Um, there's a bunch of, of interesting SSIDs you could set and a, a large number of people would automatically connect. So you may actually want to wipe that as a, as a network from your phone. So um, using HTTPS everywhere, internal, external, and, and all around the place. And as I said, automating that rollover of certificates, if you can, obviously Let's Encrypt has been encouraging that by having a very short three month uh, window. Um, the Browser CA Forum, which is the industry body that the certificate authorities are a member of, has got plans to reduce the maximum length that a certificate can be issued for. So you may remember that once upon a time you could get certificates for five years. Amazing. Let's get that. We won't have to do this for another five years. And what happens after five years? 
Two things, either you can't remember or you're no longer there. Whereas at least if it's automated, it continues to happen. Um, and also the CA has the opportunity to issue stronger certificates over time. So um, that automation is really important. You may have seen recently that there's been a number of websites across uh, North America um, where staff aren't there at the moment to rotate those certificates. Um, so it's uh, been affecting a, a large number of places with the furloughed workers of the United States during their government shutdown. Um, so anyway, TLS protocols. This is the easy one. Um, there's a few versions, and I'm going to take you through what they do. And some of you may know this, some of you it might be new, so I'm, I'm not pitching this at the very high end. Um, so when you make a connection from your web browser to uh, a service provider, a website, um, the protocol is one of the first things that gets initiated once you know where that server is, so after DNS resolution, etc. The protocol is organizing um, a key exchange and then bulk encryption. And there are two different types of encryption that are used in this. One is asymmetric public key, private key encryption. And then the much longer, ooh, hello, you're a big fly, aren't you? Right, anyway. Um, and then there's the very fast bulk encryption. So bulk encryption, um, typically AES or something like that, the advanced encryption standard. Um, quite often you'll find that that algorithm is implemented in silicon in the extensions of the CPU, so it's extremely fast. It has one slight problem that it's symmetric, which means to encrypt and decrypt, the same key has to be available on both sides across an untrusted network. So clearly that um, first bit, the asymmetric public key cryptography in red in the slide, that's actually computationally expensive and slow, so it's used to transfer the key we're going to use and obviously a few other parameters as well. So, there are just seven TLS versions out there. Uh, they did change name from being called the Secure Socket Library to the Transport Layer Security around the time the IETF took over a stewardship of the standard. Um, most of these are over 10 years old. Um, some of us have children that are that age. Um, only six of these have ever been used in the wild. Yes, SSL version one was so bad, no one ever got to saw it, see it. Um, three of them are not yet known to be compromised. Uh, and so the question is, do you, do you have any of those enabled, those compromised ones? Does, does your set on your service that you operate, or at your workplace, or at uh, any online service you use, does it support just those, or does it have some of those old ones still enabled for compatibility? And remember, the compatibility is the browsers we aren't using anymore because they're just not there in the wild. Um, zooming on that TLS 1.1, the oldest of the three that are left as we knock these out of the ballpark, little timeline of some of the browser releases that have happened over the <clears throat> two decades uh, that we've been at this. Um, TLS 1.3 is quite new. It was standardized in April of last year, of 2018. But there's that period uh, when TLS 1.1 was the leading one in 2006 through to 2008. It's a two year period. And there really was only one browser period in that, uh, released in that period, and only a few minor updates. In fact, you hardly ever see any of those in the wild at all, because those, those are Safari releases, and Safari is pretty much updated most of the time. Um, so you are highly unlikely to see any clients using TLS 1.1. So you can probably kill that out. Check it via your logs, and it, yes, question. Oh, goodness me. Um, I can't remember. You, where, so when was, uh, <laughs> can someone use a search engine or something and find out when we had IE9? It was it? 2011, okay. So if you're still supporting IE9, which I think that's actually probably the low watermark for a lot of people today, um, then yes, you can probably get rid of it. But as I said, check your logs. If you're not logging the protocol that is being used for your connections, you can probably modify it, get that, and maybe make a decision based on data as opposed to guesswork. Um, now on the flip side, your stack probably doesn't support TLS 1.3 yet. Um, so, I can take you down a little bit of another road. So one of my previous things I said was I am one of the Debian developers. Any other DDs in the room? No? Oh, I'm alone. OK, fine. Um, so I've been running Debian testing. Um, and uh, yay, we've got a reasonably recent version of Apache in there. So 2437-1, uh, as of last night, ooh, two nights ago, was the current package. OpenSSL 1.1.1a. 
And you can do something like that in your Apache configuration file. And of course, you can do similar things in Nginx, et cetera. Um, and that will give you the two current protocols that are in use. Um, but we have a big but here. But Mark Cox uh, posted this out, <laughs> that there was the first important level security issue for Apache 2.4.37 came out. So there's a 2438 that's just been released. Um, it is a denial of service uh, that you can trigger it. And I've actually seen people try and trigger that with remote diagnosis tools that are supposedly passive. Um, so uh, anytime now, there will be a new version of Apache that fixes that in there. In fact, uh, it's been a rough week for Debian. Um, there's a new version of apt out, and there's a new version of Debian uh, out today for Jesse, uh, just to fix apt, um, which has had a, a little bug with a redirection problem. Anyway, so coming back to it, protocol winners that you would want to use today is TLS 1.2 from 2008. Yes, it's uh, 11 years old. Uh, and TLS 1.3 from last year, pretty new. Um, but you should definitely determine that from your logs as to what you can get rid of. All make sense? Easy, yay. OK, let's uh, I'll turn off unused legacy protocols. That's a part of it. OK, so which side of the network am I talking about? Client side, server side, anyone want to say? Right, inspired by QA, QA, no, 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 not just server side. Anyone want to have a second, second guess? Yes, you were right, but I was going to say client side, but then both, yes. Um, you probably shouldn't be using those old protocols because they can be compromised, and so you probably on the client side, your staff, your colleagues, your friends, your family, you should probably try and get rid of it. Um, if you've got proxy servers that you use, Maybe it's a corporate proxy egressing out to the internet. Um, you might want to start to disable some of those older proxies. Now, do we have any developers in the room with us today? Anyone cut some code? Good, OK. So the next thing you want to look at is if you're connecting to anything out there and you think you're doing it over HTTPS, you might want to look at which protocols you're using there. And the reason I'm concentrating on protocols is because there's only seven. It's reasonably easy as to which ones to choose. Um, but also, some of the newer ones get rid of a lot of other configuration possibilities, which are actually really bad ideas. So uh, if you're doing Java, we've got any Java people in the room? A few. Um, so if you wanted to get to TLS 1.2, well, you could update Java 6 if you're still there. And there is a lot of stuff out there still deployed in Java 6, which will give you TLS 1.2 support, but it's pretty limited on the encryption ciphers that we'll get to. You're much better off upping to 7 or 8. Uh, and if you're brave, uh, like some of us have been, um, go for Java 11, which includes TLS 1.3 support. Uh, there was a release of 102 only about a week ago. Uh, for .NET, um, you can get TLS 1.2 potentially in 4.5 of .NET, um, 4.6 onwards it is default enabled. However, there is no TLS 1.3 support yet. Um, it's waiting for the S Channel DLL, one of the cryptographic providers within Windows, um, to support that. For Python, go Python 3.7. Um, for PHP, it just passes straight down to the OpenSSL library underneath. And so the OpenSSL library underneath is 1.1 um, and above. OK, 1.11. In fact, not, not even 1.10. It had to be 1.11. So let's get rid of all of the uh, programming languages. And I'll just tell you quickly where Debian was up to on those versions. So pretty much Debian testing has got most of this under control. Um, so when it comes out as a stable release, and the freeze has just started last week, there's a soft freeze, and it'll be hopefully this year. Um, you should be set to go on a lot of this. Now, talking about all of these older protocols, we as an industry have been horrendous at turning this old stuff off. Really, really bad. In fact, a lot of people will just turn everything that looks like a tick box on. Um, it's got so bad that the browser vendors themselves actually got together and collaborated and simultaneously released an announcement last year on October 15 saying, well, we'll take out the support for these old protocols because you guys aren't turning it off. Um, similarly, OpenSSL has indicated that they're going to rip out uh, support from uh, their libraries for older protocols over time because leaving them enabled is irresponsible. But it was pretty impressive to have them all come together and put that announcement out at the same time. OK, let's dive a little deeper. Cypher suites, which looks like yelling with underscores. Um, so I started pulling all this apart. And, and although I've been doing this for a while, it was only about two years ago that I really started to get any appreciation of what this spaghetti meant. So the key exchange we talked about earlier that happens using the really hard crypto at the beginning of the transactions. Um, once upon a time, computers were a lot slower than they were now. And there used to be a lot of key reuse. If we had a really good private key, public key sitting around, don't bother 
generating a new one, just use the one we've already got. It's nice and quick. Um, so that key exchange has been um, shown that we can actually do something a lot better. Instead of using the same key over and over again, we can use a temporary key, which we throw away just for encrypting this session. Now, we're still going to hand over our certificate to identify who we are, but that session key or an ephemeral key means that you're protected from the, if anyone manages to decrypt that session in the future, potentially, every individual session has used a new temporary key. So Diffie-Hellman became Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. The E on the end there is ephemeral. But then a new uh, uh, um, implementation was done using elliptical curves. So elliptical curves, I won't draw it for you, but it's sometimes called the billiard ball algorithm. It uses the expression of a curve in space and then a starting point and somehow bounces off the walls of that and ends up on a destination. It's effectively a trapdoor function, a one-way function to do some of that encryption. Um, nicely, it's a lot more CPU efficient than Diffie-Hellman, um, which is nice. It means it's faster which means it, it can also be stronger at the same level of computation, far, far stronger. So not only is that new uh, uh, ephemeral mathematics being used in the key exchange mechanism, it's also being used in the certificates themselves. So we've been using RSA certificates for a long time. So many of you will have potentially generated a certificate once upon a time with 512 bits in it, and then 1024 bits, and then the current standard, 2048 bits, you can see where this is going, except 4096 is incredibly slow right now. Um, elliptical curve uh, signatures, the ECDSA algorithm, um, is again significantly faster than RSA, but gives a similar or better cryptographic strength. But it's a new key signing algorithm, which means that you need a new master certificate authority when certificates are being issued. So there's a whole chain of changes again, but we've just been through this chain of changes. Once upon a time, we signed certificates using the MD5 algorithm as a hash or a thumbprint. That got changed over to SHA-1, which got changed over to SHA-256, as we've got to more unique thumbprints. Um, so we'll wait for, for CAs to start to issue those, and obviously we want the entire chain from our certificate to the root to have the same strength. It's not worth having a chain with a weak link at any point, um, and we'll get new certificates soon. So bulk encryption, AES has pretty much become the standard. So you may have come across AES-128 and 256. Anyone seen that when they've looked at crypto? No? If you do, don't, be, don't think that 256 is stronger than 128. It's a block-chained algorithm. The 128 means I'm going to encrypt 128 bits at a time or 256 bits at a time. It's not that it's twice as strong. Um, now, it does pad that block. So if the block isn't full, it'll fill it up so it is exactly 128 bits or 256 bits. And then it chains those blocks together so that they're all individually unique with a new initialization vector for each block. And there's a mode or several modes of chaining those blocks together. Do you use the output from the first block as the input to the second? And what do you use for the third one? Is it the second one? Or is it the second plus the first? Or all kinds of uh, ways of doing that. Um, and there's a mode out there called uh, Galois counter mode. Anyone heard of GCN? A few? Yeah, OK. Uh, so let me give you the other side, which I didn't put in here. Galois was a French mathematician uh, who was imprisoned in the Bastille. Um, and uh, he escaped when the Bastille was stormed. Um, which is when? 14th of March, is it? When's Bastille Day? Sorry? July. July. Thank you. Um, anyway, he was a mathematician. Anyone here a mathematician? No? Yes, one. OK. So mathematicians. Um, he was killed in a duel over a woman. It's like, you, you don't see, that's quite an interesting thing that happened to a mathematician. He was only 20, but anyway. Um, this was the 1800s, and uh, GCM is currently the only known method of chaining blocks together that is still secure. Um, because our friends at Microsoft came out with an announcement last year that said CBC mode, which was the just chain one to the other to the other to the other, um, <clears throat> Microsoft no longer believes it's safe to decrypt data that has been encrypted with the CBC mode. Um, except in very specific circumstances. Uh, I didn't want to limit myself to very specific circumstances, so I use GCM for pretty much everything I do, um, and that's probably a safe reason to be uh, to do as well. But it does mean that uh, Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer, when not running on Windows 10, um, cannot do secure encryption. Um, so it's, it's worth probably telling people that you shouldn't support IE 9 or 10 anymore. Um, go 11, 
Go Edge, um, and obviously the, the more modern browsers out there. You've also already got the TLS problem that IE9 doesn't support TLS 1.2. IE10, you actually had to go and enable it. It's like, why? Anyway, moving on. Some of those checksums that happen inside TLS, so fingerprint algorithms that you would have come up with. Um, moving to SHA-256, some newer browsers support longer checksums, but obviously they're a little bit more computationally intensive. So depending on how much traffic you're serving, you may want to stay with SHA-256 for the moment, and maybe as a standby give people ability to use SHA-384 or 512. There are new checksum algorithms coming. Um, one is called Blake. Uh, and a bunch of others. Interestingly, we know that SHA-256, how big it looks, you've all seen checksums recently. Um, the Blake algorithm it lets you apply an arbitrary length to your fingerprint algorithm. So take this data and give me a 64-bit checksum, or a 65-bit checksum, or a 1024-bit checksum. Um, it's up to you how long you want that. So that's all pretty interesting, and that's generally just configuration on a web server or a client, anything with the TCP stack, or your own code that you're writing outbound. Now, getting back to browsers specifically, um, because we've got new modern browsers, we can influence and restrict what the browser can and can't do. Now, it won't work with every browser, but we've seen the majority of them can, so we could actually increase the security posture there. And one of the first ones is the strict transport security header. It's really simple. It effectively says, please remember to make secure requests to this service by default. So if somebody types in the URL by hand without a protocol specification, where the default currently is to do unencrypted HTTP, the browser will go, hang on, I already know. I visited that site before. I made a good connection last time, and I was told to remember that. So I'm going to go HTTPS straight away. Pretty simple. In Apache, you set it to the number of seconds. That's a year. And effectively, it's a guarantee that I'm not going back to unencrypted HTTP on this site. If I stuff up my keys, I'll get fresh ones. Easy enough. Next one, content security policies. Content security policies allows you to place limits around the resources that the browser is going to load. What source am I allowing for images? Now, you probably think you're going to serve images from your own service or a CDN, but if you've got a JavaScript that suddenly loads images from a third party location, you can block the browser from loading them. So it looks something like that. So allow default from none. It's quite interesting. I don't want any content, except I'll allow image sources from self, the site it, this content security policy was loaded from, from data which is base64 encoded images in cascading style sheets. Oh, so, uh, it's, um, script source from self. Interestingly, unsafe inline. It's an interesting uh, uh, opinion they've got there. Um, that means JavaScript embedded in the page, as opposed to JavaScript loaded from an external URL. So there's quite a strong indication there that they don't trust JavaScript being put in the page when they've made this. This is a W3C implementation, by the way. Um, there's a number of levels or revisions of, of content security policy. We currently have revision 2 enabled. There is a revision 3 coming. There are more and more controls or constraints being put around what the browser can do over time, including frame source. Um, and ancestor source is another one. So if you've got anyone do frames, no frames? Yeah, a few people, yeah. Frames considered evil, yes. Um, except sometimes you're forced to. And if you have a frame in your page from a third party site, what's to stop them from putting a frame that loads from somewhere else? It's, it's turtles at that point. Um, well, you can actually limit that. You can say, I'm only going to allow a frame from a.com and nowhere else. And even if a.com frames b.com, it won't load. You'll actually be able to block it. Likewise, you can say, only allow me to be framed in nowhere. I do not wish to be framed. So if somebody tries to frame you, it won't render in the browser. Um, definitely worth looking at. They can, I'll show you an example that I use in a moment, but let me move on. Referrer policies. So the browser often gives a referrer of the page that previously browsed. And we use that for, anyone? Tracking, very good, yes. Once upon a time, analytics, but nobody uses it for analytics these days. We do analytics via what? Google Analytics these days? maybe other parties out there. So the referrer has basically become undesirable, um, especially if it's got path information in it that it might actually be a security disclosure, like a user ID equals as a query string if that's pulled across. So you can actually turn off that and tell the browser, don't bother sending me the referrer. And if you're a really busy website, saving a couple of kilobytes per request might be quite useful. 
Or you can say whether it's between origins or paths, or if I go from this site to another site, strip off the path and just leave the host name. Um, there's some really interesting options. You may have to have host name referrers because you might have another uh, uh, service that you integrate with who needs to see that referrer. Um, feature policies. This is really nice stuff. So you probably have a device in your pocket which has a web browser in it. Um, and that device can probably vibrate. Uh, it can probably make a lot of noise. Uh, more importantly, it can say where you are. Um, and JavaScript can get to that information. But with a feature policy, you can disable it and say, geolocation, nowhere is allowed to access that. So even if you're depending upon third-party JavaScript, like, for example, Google Analytics, if Google Analytics was updated to say, oh, go and get the user's geolocation information, it would be blocked. There is a long list of things on this that you can block or enable or limit that it's only JavaScript loaded from the same website or from my CDN or a trusted location, but nowhere else. Um, some older ones, X content type options, no sniff. This is when the served content doesn't match the MIME type. So MIME types describe, hey, this image, it's an image of JPEG. Um, there are some servers out there that are, would happily serve an image called text plane. Um, and a lot of the code that's been in historical browsers has been to deal with misconfigurations of servers. Here we actually get an option to say, don't try and double guess the content. If my content type is wrong, please break strictly. Don't guess that something's JavaScript when it shouldn't be, that someone's tried to put, give me an image which contains JavaScript. So this is an example of a policy or a set of headers I add into Apache on one of my services. Um, you can see that they can get quite detailed, including you know, where can um, Ajax requests, XHR requests go off to. Um, and I have got, uh, I will tell you, you know, just go to W3C um, and all of the information is there, including some of the newer stuff that's coming through. So gyroscopes, speakers and vibrate, full screen ability. Um, while we're talking about headers though, there's one other thing I wanted to say is that um, <clears throat> please stop telling people what you're running. It's totally unnecessary. Um, it makes it really easy just to go and look up a threat list and go, oh, IE10, right, well, I'll start with this one. Um, get rid of versions if you can, get rid of the whole header if you can, even better. Okay, CAA. So um, the certificate authorities are given evidence as to when they can issue a certificate in a na with a name. Um, and that evidence sometimes is a secret that is left in DNS, a key equals value. Um, and thank you. Uh, the, one of the risks is that there's a large number of certificate authorities in the world who are pre-installed on every browser and every device you've got, around 200 or more. A uh, screenshot on the right there is from uh, Android P last night. Um, you can turn some of these off if you wish. You don't have to trust them, but they are just pre-installed by default, and by default they're all enabled, um, including things like Taiwanese Internet Authority, Hong Kong Post, um, and a lot of others. Now, these certificate authorities are members of the certificate uh, CA browser forum, I should say. Um, and to remain a member, they have to follow a code of conduct, and baseline requirements of what they do. However, you can now actually inform the CAs who's authorized on your behalf to issue a certificate. So that if somebody else was to, some, to somehow convince a CA, hey, Hong Kong Post, my name's google.com, please give me a certificate. Um, there's now a mechanism that those CAs are required, since September of 2017, to check in the DNS to see if there is an authorization resource record type that lists who your authorized CAs are, and to block issuance if they are not issued, uh, listed as an identifier. So it's really easy, and it's supported in a large number of places now. Effectively, if you were to put that into that uh, domain as a record at the top, it would mean everything recursively under that could only have certificates issued by Let's Encrypt. You can limit whether it's wildcard certificates or explicitly named certificates. Set the record, forget it. The only time it's looked up is when a CA is about to issue a certificate. It's not highly used, which means you could probably set a really low cache time on it. So if you start to use a new CA and it's wrong, go change the record, go back and redo it. Don't set it for a week or a month. You could set it for 30 seconds if you wanted to. Okay, DNS sec aside number one. Um, oh. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I wasn't going to mention that we don't have DNSSEC on GovAU, but hey, New Zealand, well done on having signed zones for GovCo and OrgNZ. It's really good to see. 
Um, oh, you've had that since 2012. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, um, clearly this is good, but there are also bad times uh, for DNSSEC, um, one of which came up yesterday. Um, <clears throat> certain domains are disappearing from the internet at the moment because people aren't refreshing their keys because they haven't automated it. See that earlier point. Um, yeah, it's kind of just not good. So IAD uh, disappeared yesterday. Uh, it's part of the NSA um, for their information assurance. And ironically, they're not online at the moment. Um, that tool is called D uh, DNSVIS as well, which shows you um, signing of DNS zones. So we've kind of suddenly cut out off to DNS for a moment, but uh, there's interesting stuff happening there too. Okay, back up into the web. Um, Sub-resource integrity, version locking those external dependencies. Do you want to stop any modifications to a third-party hosted JavaScript image, whatever that happens to be? If it's Google Analytics, maybe not. You might trust their security policy to always be up to date. For others, maybe you want to. So there was an issue that happened last year where uh, a piece of, of uh, code that was used for usability on a whole bunch of government websites was modified at its shared source and injected something called coinhive.js um, to an unknown wallet. Um, the fix for this was pretty simple. You could just take a checksum and add it into the, what uh, Aaron yesterday called the img tag, or image, um, or the script source, and that basically locks it. It does mean you probably want version numbers in the file name because any change to that script will stop it from executing. So there's increased maintenance, but it means it's less likely to be modified. Cool. Moving on. Cookies. Everyone's heard of cookies? Yeah. So cookies have been around for a long time. I won't do the voice. Um, they're old. They've been there for a long time. Obviously, there's state information or session information in them. Um, and there's some flags that you can put on cookies when you set them in the browser and say, hey, this cookie, it's secure. Don't serve it over HTTP. And one of the cool things, if you forgot to serve that secure flag on a cookie, but you've got the HSTS flag, you're protected because the browser won't leak the cookie as well. Um, so, socks and shoes, basically everything up. Um, but there is a new flag, and the new flag is called Same Site from 2016. You may find that not a lot of environments support this yet. It effectively says, either in mode strict or lax, that if I'm on this site and I go to this site and I already had a session cookie here, so for example, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, whatever, if I'm in strict mode, don't serve the cookie when I land on the destination of a hyperlink. Make it look like I'm not logged in. The lax mode, similar, it only does it when the source was a post to the destination. So it stops cross-site request forgery that you get tricked into saying, you know, with a free TV, click here, and it's a post with hidden fields that goes across to Facebook and says, I really like this TV manufacturer, or whatever it happens to be. Um, now, one thing you might want to do is in inject that into the headers that are being served out from your application, see if your libraries support it, um, but it does give you a little bit of extra security for your users. And it's really, really simple, as I said, you just add the header to the end, yeah? Quite straightforward. Right, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna see it beat up. Uh, turn on HTTP2. Um, so HTTP2 has been out for a while. It's a binary wire protocol. Um, it's slightly more efficient than um, what's come before. It compresses headers, uh, and it does true multiplexing. Whereas HTTP 1.1 used to go one request, and if you had Keeper Lives turn on, you'd get a response and a second request in series. HTTP2, true multiplexing. I want this, 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 this. Okay, that one's ready, that one's ready, that one's ready. So it's a lot faster. I was going to do a demo, but I'm going to skip it. Um, but it's true parallel. I'm running out of time. Akamai has a nice demo which shows you loading about 200 images in a little diagram. And it's uh, depending on the time, you'll see it's much faster. Um, and it is possible on 2.4 uh, with Apache 2.4 on Debian. Um, in testing, you just spe specify your protocols. Um, and there's a nice little header that says, oh, by the way, if you're using HTTP2, only use those modern TLS protocols. So there's another little bit of extra that um, fixes that up. Um, but if you've got Subversion loaded with mod dev, uh, there's a seg fault that happens. Um, so that's not, not as good. However, there is a fix. Um, so uh, a few days ago, there was an update to that. And there's a hell of a lot more we can do. So uh, there's new compression algorithms to look at. There's error reporting from the browsers that you can do. Um, say, if you have an error, don't be silent about it. Report that error to my error logging service over here so you can find out what the clients are saying. Um, new key exchange mechanisms, such as what uh, Google has started with, quantum safe key exchanges. So that's the main money shot of there's a whole bunch of stuff to go do. 
whole bunch of interesting stuff that I think will give you a better security posture, faster delivery to your clients with almost zero code changes. Um, the last one I was going to say is uh, on Wednesday, I mean, Wednesday was a busy day for security as well. Um, there were six US government departments that had their <laughs> DNS domains hijacked by allegedly Iranian uh, actors. Um, and uh, US Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Director Chris Krebs, um, not our Krebs that we would know from security, um, issued that they should order DNS records, change DNS accounts, add multi-factor, and add transparency logging and reviewing that. So transparency logging has been a requirement from certificate authorities for some time. Every time you get a cert, they write it to two public locations. Facebook has a free service you can sign up to. You put in your domain name, and they will mail you every time they see a new certificate for your domain. You tick a box and they will mail you every time they see a certificate issued for something that looks like a fish of your domain name. If you put in apple.com, oh my god, um, you'll see everything out there. So the summary, if you're a sysadmin, please go update your services, not just web, IMAP, SMTP, whatever you have that's listing. Developers, if you're writing code and using a web client, please limit how far back on your protocols you're going to support. It's the easiest thing to do. Certain libraries, I think in... Um, uh, not PHP, yeah, actually it's PHP. Uh, there's a library you can use that will actually specify the minimum protocol for you and anything above. Um, and if you're DevOps, then do all the rest and everything else. For more information, there's a bunch of really interesting people. Um, Troy Hunt is up in the Gold Coast, Scott Helm in the UK, um, Ivan Ristic, Hard and Eyes. Check their sites. There's a lot of good information out there that's floating around. By reducing the number of things that you're doing and offering and supporting, you're probably reducing your risk, and it's far easier to keep track of any changes to them when there's less things to look at. That's my details. Um, I, as I said at the start, uh, I work for Modus. Um, we're hiring if anybody wants to come and hack on any of this stuff and work on this and try and um, fix up our customers' environments. Um, reach out to me, come talk to me. Thank you very much for your time. We'll just take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yay, Paul. You, you talked at the beginning about your uh, um, symmetric key algorithms. I have heard that there's still some debate re regarding the use of elliptic curve and a lot of more traditional crypto folks are much more comfortable with RSA. Can you speak to that in terms of who to listen to, what's, uh, what issues are around that? So um, I've been taking a lot of information from the resources that I had above and um, especially with one of the ones that I showed uh, back here, um, if you use SSL Labs or observatory.mozilla.com, I've been using their distilled knowledge to test services that I'm running and see how they rate them. Um, and they've been weighting GCM higher than, than other implementations. They've been rating elliptical curve higher. Um, I haven't seen anything myself about elliptical curve not being as reliable as what I think it was. I may be wrong. Um, so I'd definitely encourage you to have a look around. I, I'm, I can't give you a definite answer on that. Um, it's only recently that, that I've seen that split where the elliptical curve has been weighted higher than other things. Um, but there's a lot going on in that space. And obviously with the quantum stuff starting to come out, and IBM I think has been doing a lot on quantum computing and speaking at this conference about some of the stuff they've been doing, um, it's definitely an area that is changing a lot. So I'm sorry, I couldn't give you a better answer, but I, I, I'm not sure. It's, it's definitely a, a pretty busy. Yay! Andrew. Hi. Um, you mentioned bank grade security. If you go there, you get a single static page that says, as of November 2018, this project has been suspended. Oh, damn. So please don't send people there in your talk. OK, thank you. It was a good site. Um, probably said that once about geocities, but anyway. Um, it, it used to rate banks on uh, their corporate comms front page, home page, blah, who cares? But it also used to do an ass assessment of their internet banking services and which of these things that they turned on, turned off, um, and give them a score so you could rate them. But that's a shame. Mm. Yes, next thing. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that modern browsers are supporting uh, TLS 1.2 and above, and uh, we should not really care about uh, everything that is older because uh, it's not there. Uh, and that's true for uh, for uh, desktop browsers. Uh, there's still quite a lot of old phones, especially in third uh, world countries. Uh, and over there, there's a huge problem in case of, especially with uh, ciphers. Yes. Uh, they, most of them support TLS 1.2, but the ciphers is like really it's bad. Not. 
which is why it's worth turning on logging or adjusting your logging if you've never looked at it. I mean, most of us are probably aware of an access log, basic hit log. Modify it to include the protocol and cipher being used. If you see the protocols and ciphers being used, work out where they're coming from and why you're having it. It could be, it could be coming from a, another country which doesn't have those ciphers available. It could be coming from an old integration service that you've forgotten about, written in Python 1, still working, yeah, but probably needs some maintenance because it's not been touched. Android 4, yeah, absolutely. But then you've got to look at and assess this. You've got to weigh up, is it worth still supporting Android 4? What are you actually doing? Are you accepting credit card information? Do you need to be PCI compliant? Then you can make that judgment call. Um, are you doing something that's more important than credit card information? Well, then it's probably a good idea to follow PCI's minimum recommendations because they've got a reasonably good idea as to why not. It's all of the exploits that have happened around Poodle and the rest. Um, it's a tough decision to be in. It, You've got to then uh, sail with the security team and go, well, are we going to be strict on this or can we have backward compatibility? And that might change depending on whether it's your corporate web comms or an integration API endpoint. Um, these things are going to change over time. It's stepping stones and unfortunately we've left every other stepping stone behind us. We do need to start to pick some of them up and wait for the new ones to come through. So it's a good point, but work on data. Next, yes. What's the preferred method for getting HTTPS in places that Less Encrypt can't reach, like some stuff not on the public internet? So you're talking or, about where the common name, the domain name, is not in the public DNS? Yeah. Um, you could establish your own CA. There are scripts to do this all over the place. Using OpenSSL for free, you can establish a CA, issue that private CA public certificate to your environment and then put issue a certificate onto your service. Um, there's a lot of automated scripts to do that. Yes, Paul. Better way, to do that. Better way? yes, please. Put the microphone behind you. There's a better way to do that. Um, our internal certificate automation tool um, uses DNS-based records that are present in the external DNS to authenticate the keys that it's creating for internal sites. So they They've got an alternate mechanism now that you can use without needing to expose something to the public. There you go. Awesome. Oh. On behalf of everyone, has a small token of our appreciation. Let's give them one big. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you.